Thanks you guys for joining us today for our fourth episode of Passion for Success. Um, Abby was busy uh, doing the whole virtual learning. I was trying to put my son down and he was refusing. So if you hear some screaming and crying, he might actually come join us here in a second. Um, but we're so excited today because we get to be inspired once again by one of the best of all times. Um, Two-time Olympic gold medalist, World Cup champion. She's already in the Soccer Hall of Fame. Scored just 184 goals during her national team career. I do. Um, the <laughs> they one, were big ones, though. I love the, those goals you scored. <laughs> the one, the only, Abby Wambach. Um, so, Abs, obviously, a lot has transpired since you retired in 2015. Um, you know, I couldn't be happier for you with everything that you've done. You've written two books, a third coming on the way. And obviously I'm sure all of us are busy watching you guys on social media, you and your lovely family. Um, so just kind of catch us up on what you've been up to. Okay, so, you know, what was so wonderful about being on our national team is this environment of other amazing, ambitious women who weren't afraid to want more than they had, who weren't afraid to ask for more. And I think that that collective unit that we were able to build on the national team was done in such a way, and, and the culture was set up in such a way that when we stepped into it, we got to make it somehow uniquely our own, yet we were still adhering to this way that this, the, the, the national team culture has always been striving with this relentless pursuit of excellence idea, this method. Um, and so when I first retired, this is back in 2016, um, stripping myself from the identity of soccer player wasn't that hard because at 35, I was kind of tired of playing soccer, truly. Like, it's fun until it becomes a job and then a have to. It's like anything that's so much fun. Like when you start getting paid to do it, inevitably becomes really difficult because you reach limits that are almost impossible to, 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 to top. But when I stripped that soccer identity away, I thought that my life was gonna crumble, but it didn't. I was like really excited about like what was gonna happen, but what actually ended up being so difficult and hard to manage and navigate in my retirement was dealing with being by myself a lot. So being out on the road and being um, this professional speaker, um, I was alone in my hotel rooms. I was alone on airplanes. I was alone in car rides. And that was so profoundly hard for me to get used to, not just because I'm an extrovert, um, but because I really thrived in an environment that was so fueled by ambitious, badass women who always was trying to achieve more, right? Um, and so for me, I felt a little bit untethered for those first few months of my retirement, trying to figure out what the heck I was gonna do because like most people on this call realize that women soccer players don't earn enough money to be able to live forever on what they earn during their playing career. They actually have to reinvent themselves to be able to pay their mortgages. So that's kind of what um, happened to me. And, and, uh, and though it was a terrifying time, I think it was an important time for me to figure out what it was in fact I wanted to do. Um, and then the universe conspired uh, for me and put me in the same room as my wife, Glennon Doyle, who um, talk about finding another person who is on the same path and has the same passions about making the world better. Um, so the minute we met, the minute we um, got together and connected lives, um, we've been just kind of helping each other um, through the last couple of four years of our lives, five years of our lives. Um, and I don't know, it's just been wonderful. This retirement thing is great. Um, the, the having to work out and not <clears throat> killing two birds with one stone, like I always said as a player, that's a little bit more difficult. Uh, to motivate myself to stay fit and stay healthy, but such is life. I am now a normal person who has to deal with working out outside of work. 
Well, you couldn't be happier and we can all see that. And I'm so happy for you that you've been able to find Glennon and to share um, your wonderful family with all of us. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, changing tunes a little bit because I like to ask every single one of the national team players who I have interviewed, what was it like growing up you know, with your parents as far as their role that they played on your athletic career? Oof, this is a really, really good question because I have two daughters now that they both play. They're one is 12, the other is 14. They both play uh, in the ECNL programs. So I, I have a front line, you know, front, a front row seat and I get to watch how parents are on the sidelines right now. And let me tell you, it's not good. Um, parents are the worst and they can't help themselves. Um, half the time they're screaming incorrect things onto the field in terms of directions. Um, and it's just frustrating to watch your kids feel, literally, I feel like they're getting shot at from the sidelines with voice. Like, they're like, who do I listen to? My coach or my parents? My teammates coach? My parents? And the game of soccer is all about somebody making the specific decision on the field, on the ball, in the moment. Um, so the way that I was raised, and I think that this was really helpful, it was just by chance, by the way. My mom was the one that drove me everywhere. My dad worked for the most part and played golf for the other part of the day. Um, and so my mom drove me from practice and games and tournaments and um, ODP and, and whatever it was, my mom was driving me to the field and she knew nothing about soccer. Like for, for real, when I got to college, she would say, good score. And I'm like, I don't know, Ma, it's not really how it goes. Um, she, I think at the end of my career, literally maybe five years ago, just started to learn really what offside was. Um, so she didn't really know. And her whole methodology and philosophy from parenting is just keep your mouth shut because number one, you don't know who's around you, right? Like you don't know if you're gonna like, ugh, in disgust over a player's missed shot or missed goal and their parents are sitting right next to you. Um, and then of course, you know, the next moment your kid is gonna mess up. Like soccer is all about mistakes. It's, it's like literally the one of the sports are all about like that one perfect moment in the game or the four times in the game where you're completely su successful. So um, yeah, being quiet on the sidelines is a skill for parents that they have to learn. Uh, drop your kids off at practice and drive away. Let them train. Let them be by themselves with their friends, problem solving, the whole bit. Um, our philosophy in our family is when the kids get back in the car, I say three things to them. Number one, I loved watching you play today. Number two, did you learn anything? And number three, I love you. That's it. Those are, those, are, those are the only three things that I say. Um, there's been a lot of studies done. In fact, we, we went to the University of Florida where Heather and I went to college. We went to their uh, summer camp two summers ago. And what they told us is they interview all of the kids when they come to camp. And they survey all these kids. And over the 15, 20 years of this program, they've surveyed thousands and thousands of kids. And the number one answer to uh, every single survey in terms of who they wish that they could they could be driven home from a game from would be is their grandparents and the reason why is because grandparents don't even watch the game for the game's play right they're like oh look at my grandkid has the ball yay oh look at they did the thing and scored the thing and did the try and awesome right you want to get some ice cream and that's just the truth like Kids are not, all of our kids are not going to be able to play on the national team and we need to stop acting like they are. That's great advice, Abs. Um, I was just curious because my parents were just super supportive of me, always, my biggest fans. So, and I know that your parents would be too. I saw them at all the University of Florida games. I don't think they missed a game. Yeah, they did. Um, so you grew up in a large family. You were the baby. Um, mm -hmm. I see how tough my two-year-old is. Mm -hmm. um, because he's the baby and the other two kind of beat up on him a little bit. Mm -hmm. How much did your siblings play a role in your sports career? Huge. 
you know, being the youngest of seven, first of all, I was just like in the role of the, of the observer for the first bunch of years of my life um, on my parents' hip uh, or my older sister's hip just being literally carted from one of their sporting events to, to the other. Um, so for a long while, I just remember watching them and being envious of them. Like my sisters were in high school um, and in college when I was like six, seven, eight years old. Um, I was shooting baskets uh, on the basketball court during halftime, you know, and the, I just remember that time being so important um, because I think too often we forget about the things that we watch our brothers and sisters or our friends go through, the positives and the negatives and the things that we can, can learn from them. Um, one of the things that was really important to me was that I didn't want to, and I knew this from an early age that I was going to be a good soccer player, but I wanted to give my parents this gift of uh, not having to pay for my college tuition. Um, knowing that they paid for six other kids to go to college. It was just my goal. I don't know why. I do know a little bit why now because I wanted to take, I wanted to learn how to take care of myself at a, as a young kid and at, at a young age. Um, but having older brothers and sisters, not only because I was always striving, it was like I was always in a constant leveling up situation in my life. Um, so whether it was like playing solitaire or card games or like diving into the pool and having your parents rate the dives, like any kind of situation, it was always some sort of competition. And I think that that fueled me for the person that I am and the person I became on the national team, because it's like when you're, when you're training how to be on a team from the time that you were born, and then you find yourself literally on a team in every phase of your life to get to the national team. Um, yes, it, it is very difficult to get to the national team. It's very difficult to stay on the national team. Um, the speed of play, it, I just remember those first few practices and I just was like so out of my, I was so out of my zone. I just, I couldn't even keep up with the pace. I wanted to go home, um, but I just remember feeling like, okay, I've been the younger one. I've been to the less experienced one my whole life. I can handle this. Um, so Abs, I wanted to share kind of a funny story because uh, you took a gamble, I think, by going to the University of Florida. You were, weren't you the Gatorade Player of the Year, high school yeah. player of the year? Yeah. And you came on a recruiting trip to University of Florida, and then we ended up playing against UNC during the tournament, and Abby happened to be at her visit at UNC. Mm -hmm. And we got spanked. We got beat 5-1. Mm -hmm. And after the game, I remember we, we saw Abby and we all kind of we were really bummed, A, that we had gotten beaten that bad and B, that, you know, obviously there's Abby Wambach and there's no way she's going to come to our school if she sees that the fact that we just got slaughtered like that, right? But lo and behold, Abby decided to do something different and she came to University of Florida. Mm -hmm. And we won a national championship, what, that year. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to know kind of what was your thinking? What, what went into the factors that you had to choose to do something a little bit different and go to University of Florida? For whatever reason, from a young age, I decided that I was going to believe in myself and turn towards myself and, and trust my instinct on things. Um, when I went to the University of Florida on our on my recruiting trip, I felt like this place could be home to me. I felt like all of you, all of you players that were on the team treated me so great. I had the best time. Um, and then you know I I find myself on the University of North Carolina campus. I'm like look, all of us kids growing up like UNC at the time and even now to some degree, um, it was the dynasty that if you were a great soccer player, like that was the pinnacle, that was like the Mecca where you wanted to find yourself one day. Um, and the, the, the visit was going okay. Um, it wasn't like a home run by any means. And then they kind of beat up on, on you guys, like who I thought were my friends, right? So I was feeling a little bit sad for you all. And when we as recruits were walking across the field, Every single one of you guys whose season was just ended 
um, walked across the field and all of you acknowledged me. All of you players saw me, even though you were so upset and said hello. And I thought that that was so profound. I thought that was so different. Like y'all were real. Like even though you were in like the hardest moment of your year, um, that you still thought to like even look up at this, not even, I wasn't even in college. I was a, I was a senior in high school. Um, that was really amazing to me. And then I find myself the next day at the airport with Anson Dorrance, the coach of UNC, and he decided that he was going to offer me books. And that was it for a college scholarship. And that that was the kind of the icing on the cake for me. I was like, come on. I was like, dude, I'm the national player of the year. How are you going to offer me books? And he had this whole system in place that you needed to play on the U21 team or the youth on the full national team for a few games a year to, to even be considered for a full ride at UNC. And it was just his stupid method. He was actually quoted years later that he made a stupid decision by just offering me books. Um, because, you know, we went and we beat up the, them in the, the championship game of the next um, NCAA tournament. So that was really nice. A very, very good deal in the end. Yeah, thank you for that. Wow, his loss. Um, go Gators. Yeah. So, Abs, I saw how much of an impact playing with Mia Hamm in the league actually had on you, not only on the field, but also off the field. Yeah. And I just kind of wanted to ask you, who do you feel like had the biggest impact on your national team career? I would have to say a few people. Um, and because, you know, when you get a chance to play for over a decade, decade and a half, um, you come across a lot of people that made an impact early in my career. I would definitely say Mia and Julie Foudy and Joy Fawcett um, and Christine Lilly. I mean, I I think that she gets left out of so many of these conversations, but um, to me, Lil was the most professional player. You too, actually. I, I always would tell you that too. Like you were the most consistent player that I think that our national team ever had. Um, you could always rely on Heather Mitz for making that tackle. You could always rely on Heather Mitz for like kicking your ass in fitness it was so annoying I'm just like you show up and she just always had this smile on. I was actually just telling my trainer this this morning the story of my first preseason at Florida and we we walk into our noon out of the second out of three training sessions that day and you were standing by the goalpost and I was so tired from our our um, fitness testing that early mornings from from sunrise and I couldn't move my legs and I just said to you Heather <laughs> I don't know how to do this. Like, I can't move my legs. And you were like, you just do. And you like ran off with this <laughs> smile on your face. And I was like, what is wrong with her? She's got something wrong with her. What? Um, but yeah, like, you know, I had a lot of really great teammates. Christian Rampone became um, one of those people, not just players, but people in my life that I could really rely on um, to help me through some stuff and she was such a great leader we i think we played really well off of each other she was very quiet uh led by example and i was obnoxious and loud um and then i think that pia uh and i i don't know what your relationship with pia is but she had a really big impact on me in terms of the way that i the, the way that i viewed a woman taking on leadership roles mm -hmm. um from from the beginning of my national team career I just saw other women acting like what they thought they should be acting like. Um, I saw other women um, trying to be like dudes and guys in situations that it was just not necessary, right? Like we're actually all women here. And what we need is some, a, a woman who is stepping into her full humanity as a woman. Um, and Pia Sunaga really did that for me and showed me <clears throat> a kind of leadership that uh, I had never witnessed before. So I would say kind of in general, all of those people. Heather O'Reilly was like my buddy from the beginning. Um, friends and she was the one that when you left Heather would push the envelope fitness wise. Yeah. Um, I had a really good experience with Pia too. Um, I feel like Pia was just herself. 
you know, and she was who she was going to be. No, no one was going to change her. And I do feel like she was a really um, good coach from that aspect. So it's nice to hear you say that. And all those women that you mentioned, yes, they're all amazing. And we have been so fortunate to have played alongside so many badass women, including yourself. So um, if you could go back, Abby, and change one thing to impact your playing career, what would it be? I would have stopped drinking. I, I was suffering a lot at the end of my career. Um, and I think that part of me believed that I needed to have this like other personality when I wasn't playing so that I could show up and play fully emotionally and be all in. A lot of you guys know me as being all or nothing, right? Like that was the, the personality and the, the persona that I kind of created throughout my time on the national team. And the truth is I created that drama um, unnecessarily. Uh, I've been sober for four, over four years now, almost five years. And I realized that my playing career probably would have lasted maybe four or five years longer had I taken care of myself in that way. Um, and probably also took care of my body a little bit better, maybe not be as physical. <laughs> Um, I, I worry a little bit about my brain um, now with all of the heading that I did as a, as a player, you know, and as a parent, you get to put on a whole different mindset and a whole different um, hat whenever you're watching the game, you know, the ball goes up in the air and I'm like, uh, please don't head that Tish or please don't head that Emma, <laughs> let it fall, fall to the ground or like body your defender and create space. Um, so teaching them kind of to do things maybe a little bit different because there's just not enough to know about our brains and what really is going to happen in my future, right? So those are things that I probably would change. And congratulations, by the way. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So leading has always been something that seemed very natural for you, Abby. You're an amazing leader. Um, what do you think it takes to be an effective leader? I think that this is a really important question and because people view me as quote unquote, uh, a person who's written a book on leadership, a person who's led our national team to championships, uh, captain, whatever. Um, they're like, Oh, she's a great, she must be a great leader. And the truth is I really sucked at it at first. Um, I was trying to be somebody that I wasn't. Um, I was trying to be the leaders that I had seen from the past um, or leaders that I, I was making up in my head. And I think that that's why it was so important for Pia to come in at that point in my career um, because she really showed me that all I needed was to be myself um, and to show up as my full self uh, in leadership and to not deny parts of who I was because they aren't necessarily labeled as leadership personality traits, like being emotional or for women being ambitious. Um, you know, these things are kind of told to young girls and women um, that in order to succeed, you need to be quiet and to placate men and to fit in as much as you possibly can. Um, and the truth is the most important leadership lesson that I can teach you today is to show up fully as yourself. And if you're feeling something on the inside, that has to somehow come out on the outside. It's called living an integral life, to be integrated from your inside and your outside. Too many of us have, have these internal worlds that we don't express on the outside. Um, and the way in which you communicate some of those internal worlds will determine if you are a good leader or not. Those communication um, things that, that, that now in our day and age um, is hard because we have these cell phones, right? We have these things that make it a little bit more difficult to find that communication between player, coach, player, player, teacher, uh, student, parent, uh, kid. So finding ways to become and, and be true to yourself and then also to understand that like, if you can't lead in your own personal life 
For instance, if you're not getting up and, and getting breakfast and being on time and doing your schoolwork and doing all the other things in your life, and then you walk out on the soccer field and expect to be a leader, like you're actually not doing it right. Like you're putting the cart before the horse. You've got to actually be a leader of your own self in your own life before you go out and try to get any kind of uh, leadership grade or leadership um, in the world of soccer or in your classroom or whatever. Take care of business at home. In, in sobriety, it's called clean up your side of the street first. Thank you for that, Abby. Yeah. Um, I, I think that everything in life happens for a reason. So what was your aha moment? Um, I mean, I've had a bunch, if I were to be real <laughs> honest. Um, I think, I mean, obviously the reason why I got sober was, uh, you know, I got pulled over, I got a DUI and it was the worst moment of my life. Um, and what has then become, become the best moment of my life. Uh, and I think that that's something that was built inside of me throughout my time playing on the national team. This idea that a failure is only a failure if you let it keep you down, right? So, uh, you know, for me, when I had to call my mom and tell her this news, it was like the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me. And I, I couldn't believe that I had to tell my mom this information. And she just said some profound things to me that made me understand that no matter what kind of childhood or relationship that I had with my mom, that like parents and you need your people around you to support you. She said, listen, we all make mistakes. And yes, this is a big one, but I know you and I know your heart and I know you're gonna do whatever it takes to like make this right. And it just gave me enough space to be the idiot that I was. It also gave me the time and the confidence to be able to like really deal with my problems. Um, and then the whole shame of it all kind of got wiped away um, because I needed to make this completely right. This moment where I felt like I had hit rock bottom, um, I wanted to make it worth it. I didn't want to lose a single a moment of what I could learn or how I could make this better. Um, and had it not been for that, I wouldn't have met Glennon. I wouldn't have the life that I have today. I would not have written these books. Like so many things would not have happened. Um, and you know, and now listen, now I'm living in totally integrated life. What is happening on my inside is literally happening on the outside. You and your wife, Glennon, helped to create Together Rising, um, which is absolutely amazing. And I want you to tell everybody a little bit more about the wonderful work that you guys are doing. Yeah, so Together Rising is a nonprofit that my wife started, I think over six, seven, eight years ago before we even met. Um, I sit on the board of it now. And essentially what she does is she connects her community, the people that want to give together rising money and donate. She connects those dollars with the people who are on the ground already doing the work. Um, it's our philosophy at Together Rising and belief that there are a lot of people doing really amazing work in the world. And what Together Rising does is vet and scout for those who are doing it the best um, with the highest rate of success and most oftentimes with the least amount of funding. Um, because a lot of times the red tape with the nonprofit world, so much money gets lost um, in percents, uh, not going from, from donate, donation to the cause, right? So, so their, our role as, uh, as a nonprofit is to try to get as much money to the people who actually need it. Um, so we're this pass-through sort of thing. Um, they are very current, uh, a lot of current events that, you know, big crises happen. Together Rising shows up and um, your money, every penny that Together Rising receives from you all goes directly to the, the actual cause that they're raising specific money for. So it's a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful organization. Honestly, I'm just like, I'm so proud to be a part of it. Um, they've raised over $26 million uh, to go to help, helping um, serve women and children, hurting women and children around the world. It's pretty amazing. 
Well, Abby, from the first practice at the University of Florida, I knew that you were going to be a leader. I knew that you were going to make a change, not only on the soccer field, playing with you, but also in your life after. And I'm just so proud of you and all the work that you and Glenn and your family are doing. And um, thanks so much for inspiring us again today. Thank you for having me. And again, I'm so sorry that this is 20 minutes late. If I knew that you all were to have actually be on this thing, I would have shown up at, at noon, no doubt. My children can take care of themselves. Heather, I love you, sister. You're the Thanks best. For having me.